welcome um, to another. We're getting ahead. Um, Darlene was asking where we are in our trajectory, the speaker series um, for the summer, and we think we're just past the halfway mark. So um, really glad that you're here with us this evening. Um, my name is Cynthia Cutting, and I'm with uh, the Museum of the White Mountains, and very um, glad to have my right and left hand, uh, Rebecca, and then with us this evening. Um, who is managing tonight's meeting for us. Very helpful. Um, and um, so I don't forget later, if you have questions this evening or comments, um, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. There you go, Becky, I remembered. Um, so definitely uh, put in your thoughts there. It's, it's great. And because we're recording this session, it's wonderful to be able to hold on to those comments and uh, to be able to share them later. So um, definitely add your questions in there today. So first off, I would like to thank um, the New Hampshire Humanities for funding the entire speaker series this summer. We're really grateful. It gave us such a boost to know we were going to be able to not only be open to the public this summer with wayfinding maps of the White Mountains on view, but also that we'd be able to gather together, even if it is in this virtual way, um, the, to be able to share ideas and to have a discussion and to hear from some wonderful um, thought-provoking presenters um, this summer. So it uh, just warms my heart to be able to meet like this. And the great thing about our Zoom format is we have people from all over the country here and um, it is expanding the presence for the museum. Um, beyond our um, drivable area. So I am really, really happy with it. Um, and I know some of us are getting tired of Zoom, but it, every so often this is a good one to stick in with and tonight will be no exception to that. Um, I also would really like to thank our Museum of the White Mountains members. Their, their loyal support has helped us through um, this last year and a bit. And we are so very grateful to be able to have opened strong and with um, create the, su the support to create a really wonderful exhibition at the museum for this summer and to be able to plan for next year now, which is fantastic. So thank you members. If you're not a member of the Museum of the White Mountains yet, um, please consider joining us. We would love to have your support and your ideas and your, um, and your presence um, in our group. Um, it's really great, wonder, great group of people that really care about all things about the White Mountains. And there's, oh, there's a topic that you'll be interested in for sure. So consider joining us. Uh, thank you also to the Museum of the White Mountains Advisory Council. This is a specially, special group of people who um, help to plan and think and um, support the work that we do, uh, both creating exhibitions and also creating events like this. And we have several of our advisors here with us this evening. Thank you so much for being here, um, including our co-curator, Adam Apt. Adam, can you give us a wave? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're so grateful to Adam um, for um, helping to create the exhibition that is at the museum right now um, and, um, and, and sharing with us several items from his collection. So it's really, really wonderful. And when you come to visit the exhibition, you'll be able to read um, Adam's reflections about many of the maps and the history of them. Um, we also have Dave Gavatsky here this evening, who is a wonderful advisor and um, helped to uh, advise specifically on this exhibition, which has been wonderful. Thank you, Dave. Um, and um, so lots of thank yous. We're so proud to have all these things happening. It's really great to feel everyone's support and to have such a great number of people with us this evening. And I know that's because, well, most of you know our speaker. Um, and Becky, we know our speaker pretty well too. And we're so glad that Becky Fullerton is with us once again this evening. Um, Becky has been a friend to the museum since the very beginning. In, in her role as archivist of the Appalachian Mountain Club, she has provided essential partnership and artifacts for numerous exhibitions. She's presented many terrific talks and she has been a wonderful advocate for our mission. So I'm really, oh, I've always been grateful for Becky and I always look forward to her talks because they are so creative and have so much great history and information. And she calls herself a history nerd, but we rely on her thorough knowledge of the region's history in hiking and hikers. 
And of course, she's a hiker herself. This June, she hiked the entire Franconia range from Skookumchuk, I always say that wrong, trail to Lincoln Woods. And this month, she hiked most of the Kinsman Ridge Trail from Cannon Mountain to Real Book. If you follow our museum Instagram, and why wouldn't you, you will also know that we follow Becky and her artwork, and you'll be able to see what her painting is right behind her. She's, she is a notable White Mountain landscape painter. So um, I'm looking forward to adding my uh, questions to the chat as well. Um, and I am so glad that Becky is with us this evening. So welcome, thank you, Becky, and take it away. Thank you, Cynthia. And thanks again to the Museum of the White Mountains for having me back for yet another little piece of the great lecture series that you always put on in conjunction with the exhibitions. And this is no different. The Wayfinding exhibition is awesome. You should go see it if you haven't. You should go see it again if you have. <laughs> and I will get right into my program. If I can share my screen, hopefully, correctly. <laughs> All righty. This window out of the way. Move that window out of the way. All right, great. Uh, and my slide formatted weirdly. <laughs> But anyway, um, so I'm doing a talk this evening called Wayfinding in Their Own Words. And what I thought I would do was use kind of in the same um, theme as the Wayfinding show is to use all kinds of different sources in conjunction with maps to really dive in and explore a part of the White Mountains. Um, so this is, this is all about being my history nerd self, <laughs> really. Um, but have you ever tried to retrace the steps of an explorer from before your own time? Have you puzzled over old maps to try to figure out how they correspond or don't line up with the contemporary landscape? Well, today we're going to take a look at one specific area of the White Mountains through that lens using published accounts, excerpts written by hikers on the ground, by historical and contemporary photos, and of course, in the theme of the, the exhibition with maps. And I'm going to zero in on the Pemajawasset wilderness because A, we have lots of material in the archives and the published world about that area. And B, because I feel that the Pemajawasset or the Pemi as it's often called, and I'll probably refer to it that way too, has remained more persistently wild over time compared to some of its more kind of civilized neighbors like the presidential range. The Pemi has been alternately viewed over the ages as an impassable wilderness, as an angler's and hunter's paradise, as a breadbasket for the lumberman, a vast desolation of blackened slopes a magnificent stretch of pathless wilderness, and finally as New Hampshire's largest wilderness. So it's been many things to many people, but to me it still holds this kind of element of mystery for all of the layers of history that are laid out on top of it and for the many attempts and misadventures uh, made at getting into it. So we're going to take a look. We're going to use some maps. Um, this is a very cool little illustrated map uh, that was made in the 1920s of some of the PEMI. Uh, you can see it's kind of free drawn. <laughs> and we're going to hear from some of the hikers who were going into that era, uh, starting way, way back in the 19th century. So this is the area that I'm going to focus on today, uh, the official Pemajawasset Wilderness Area, which was established in 1984, is the area that's bounded by the thick gray line on this map here. So the Franconia Ridge bounds it on the west side, the Twin Range and the Zeeland Valley uh, bound it on the north, Crawford Notch is over to the east, and the Kankamagus Highway runs along the south part of the wilderness. The, the mountains around it create this kind of bowl shape and the streams therefore drain into the east branch of the Pemajawasset River. 
it's a pretty tough place to get in and out of without climbing over a mountain range, uh, unless you go in through that kind of southern portion where the river exits. And it's also really challenging to figure out why and when people first started going into this area. The history uh, of the deep parts of the Pemi are pretty limited. Mount Washington and the Presidential Range, as you may know, or as you can imagine, uh, are pretty well explored by uh, the time we get up to the 19th century or so. In 1642, you have the first European settler um, going up to the top of Mount Washington in the form of Darby Field. You have the Manasseh Cutler expedition of 1784 that's leading a geological expedition over the range. And then by 1819, you already have the Crawford Path, which leads from Crawford Notch all the way to the summit of Mount Washington. So it's, it seems pretty civilized um, compared to the Pemi. The Pemi is left largely alone by white settlers all through uh, these eras, not having any kind of prominent peaks, not having any broad, cleared river valleys, and no famous notches like the presidential range has. Now we know that there were native people living in the area. There was the Kawasuk and Pemajawasset Pemaj bands of the uh, Abnaki in the area. And we know that they had roots through places like Franconia Notch, leading for um, trade and expeditions, just like they were uh, moving through the Saco River Valley. But we don't know much more about what they knew uh, about this area of the wilderness. They certainly were aware of it and probably knew it pretty well um, compared to us settlers uh, in that time. So some of the first maps that we see of the region leave this area out entirely. It's just kind of a blank spot. Uh, in Joseph Blanchard and Samuel Langdon's An Accurate Map of His Majesty's Province of New Hampshire in New England from 1761 has the White Mountains on it. Here they note that the White Mountains can be seen from the ocean. And you can see that they have kind of these tall bits marked out on the map, but the area that kind of indicates where the Pemajawasa wilderness would be in the center is completely blank. To the early written reports um, of the area, note a bunch of things about the mountains too. They say that lots of rivers seem to come out of this area and flow down to join the Pemajawasa. But any further details that the surveyors uh, say are there, they are uninformed about this area. It would be almost a hundred years before we could parse out a whole lot more about this part of the mountains. By the mid 19th century, we finally get to see a real survey of the area and folks actually venturing in there and taking down some details about it. The biggie is George Philip Bond's 1853 map of the White Mountains, and it's based on his surveys from 1850 and 1853. And one of his notebooks from those early surveys is actually part of the Wayfinding exhibition. It's really cool. Um, this, is one of, this is the first topographical map of the White Mountains. So it's showing um, the elevations of the mountains. It's showing kind of the topography of the place with these Hatcher lines on it. Uh, and at last, we finally get to see where the East Branch of the Pemajawasset River is going. He's got some of the summits marked out, although you can note that there are not a lot of names on these mountains yet. Soon enough, Mount Bond, West Bond, and Bond Cliff would all bear his own name. But now we can get a nice clear vision of the place. And from here on out, a few brave souls start to actually venture into the valley. So between 1869 and 1871, Charles Hitchcock, Joshua Huntington, and a bevy of Dartmouth College students 
did a thorough survey of the area between the Saco and Pemigewasset rivers and north of Sandwich. Uh, of the 1871 survey, Hitchcock reports on the 17th of June, with the assistance of 11 gentlemen from the graduating class of Dartmouth College, the exploration of the Pemigewasset country was commenced and continued uninterruptedly for a month. These gentlemen kindly proffered their services without charge and deserve the thanks of the community for their exertions on our behalf. So here you have an, an early example of unpaid internships. Uh, Hitchcock goes on. Some have imagined the party as enjoying the luxuries of the season in cushioned seats of well-appointed hotels about the mountains with every want eagerly anticipated by dutiful attendants. On the contrary, our houses were hastily extemporized sheds, our beds a few boughs or ferns placed upon boards, our food consisted of stale crackers and preserved meats, save a rare taste of trout or berries gathered in climbing mountains, and the luxury of an occasional basket of provisions sent by kind friends at the profile house. And we were our own servants. So actually it's more like unpaid nonprofit interns to be accurate. Um, some of the highlights of this survey work included the discovery of a new lake, which they christened Haystack Lake because it was close to the Great Haystack, which was the original name of Mount Garfield and therefore Garfield Pond before they were renamed for the president. They traversed all of the major peaks, the Twins, the Bonds, Gio, and lots of other places that no one had ever visited before. And Hitchcock states in his report that the region held, quote, scarcely any mountains more difficult to reach than these on account of the stunted growth near their tops. All of these first parties, all of these people that are starting to go into the PEMI notice the terrain and the ruggedness and especially this scrub growing on all of the mountaintops. The scraggliness persists in kind of keeping people out of the area, but eventually a few more start to explore and describe the PEMI. In Samuel Adams Drake's 1882 book, The Heart of the White Mountains, he paints a picture of the area for us, looking for from the more civilized notches and roads around the PEMI and into its center. And he says, on all sides is beauty, harmony, and grace. On the other, a packed mass of bristling, steep-sided mountains seen storming the sky with their gray turrets. Could we but look over the brawny shoulders of the mountains opposite to us, the eye would take in the vast, untrodden solitudes of the Pemigewasset forests, cut by the East Branch and presided over by Mount Carrigane. A region is yet reserved for those restless and adventurous spirits whom the beaten paths of travel has ceased to charm or attract. But an excursion into this forest, primeval, is to be no holiday promenade. It is an arduous and difficult march over slippery rocks, through tangled thickets, or up the beds of mountain torrents. Hard fare and a harder bed of boughs finish the day every hour of which has been a continued combat with fresh obstacles. At this price, one may venture to encounter the virgin wilderness, or as the camp phrase is, to try, quote, roughing it. It is a curious feeling to turn your back upon the last cart path, then upon the last footpath, to hear the distant baying of a hound grow fainter and fainter. In a word to exchange, at a single step, the sights and sounds of civilized life, the movement, the bustle, for a silence broken only by the hum of bees and the murmur of invisible waters. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Drake is really not selling this to your average person. Um, it's, it's a very specific person that's going to find these words appealing. Fortunately, among the Appalachian Mountain Club, there were lots of people, just this kind of person who would find these words attractive. And they began to enter the PEMI with exploration and trails in mind. 
1882, a small group led by Augustus E. Scott, a lawyer from Lexington, Mass, decided to traverse the Pemigewasset and cross as many mountain summits as he could. He wrote a full report about his trip in Appalachia Journal, and he teases the reader with the allure of this deep place, but also with some kind of entertaining bits about the situation and how the trip came to be. He starts out saying, the Twin Mountain Range has long been regarded by Appalachians as an interesting field for exploration. Many times we have looked longingly from higher summits, especially from Lafayette upon its bare ledges and wooded ridges and resolved at an early day to make their more intimate acquaintance. But the summits are so distant from the clearings and the reports of those who had attempted to reach them and failed were so discouraging that it was difficult to find anyone who cared to join the undertaking. So he's having a hard time finding anybody that wants to go in there with him. And he hires a woodsman and guide to try to get somebody else to sign up. The woodsman talks to somebody else who talks with somebody else who reaches out to a gentleman of somewhat prominent, uh, a gentleman somewhat prominent at Bethlehem, which is uh, where I live, who spoke to a female friend of his. And she expressed an interest in going on this expedition if there were other ladies who would go to. So Scott continues in his report, I replied at once, that they had failed to find any man who wished to undertake it. And it had not occurred to me as among the possibility that any woman would desire to do so. But I added half in jest, whenever I hear of a woman who desires to explore wild places and to see the old forests as they exist far away from ordinary routes of travel, I am filled with an equal desire to assist her in doing so. If Miss X, is capable of enduring long continued and fatiguing work, can endure thirst perhaps for hours, can sleep without blankets or possibly without shelter of any sort, can force her way through scrub of the most fearful kind where the clothes may be torn to shreds, can endure extremes of heat and perhaps cold, can go all day in a storm drenched to the skin. If she can endure these things, and after my assurance that these and even greater hardships are probable on the proposed trip, still wishes to make the attempt, I will invite the only other lady I know for whom the undertaking is feasible to accompany her. By the returning mail, I was informed that notwithstanding all my discouragements, Miss X was exceedingly anxious to go on the exploration. While reading this last letter in the presence of another lady member of the club, she at once enthusiastically asked to join the party. I was fairly caught. I had painted the probable difficulties of the proposed exploration in glowing colors and had rather disdainfully expressed a willingness to invite ladies to accompany me if they dared to attempt it. And here were three ladies who not only dared but were eager to go. So now he is trapped with a whole crowd of ladies that want to go into the Pemi with him. And so off they went on an August day from a point somewhere along the Amanusik River, just down the road from the Twin Mountain House, which was once right at the junction of routes three and 302 today. After crossing a field, they were in the woods. So there were a few logging roads that kind of traversed the first part of this area. It sounded like the forest was still pretty dense. This is before the era of logging railroads. The Little River Railroad, which would be built in 1893, was not yet there to clear the way or help them get into this part of the woods at all. So the party was made up of Augustus Scott, as I mentioned, the, one, the guy who had this whole idea from the beginning. Uh, he had two guides, a man of about 60 and a younger man. And then our three ladies were a doctor, a female medical student, and a, quote, special correspondent who later published a account of her trip in the White Mountain Echo, which was a, a newspaper that was published right here in Bethlehem. Though the names of the ladies are not published in Scott's accounts, and they are not published in the White Mountain Echo, 
they are put into a very short column that was published in the Among the Clouds paper, which was um, put out on the top of Mount Washington as kind of a tourist newspaper. Uh, and it was published on August 21st. So we know who the women were. They uh, included Martha Fairfield Whitman, an enthusiastic AMC member. She actually joined the club just after we were founded. And she almost immediately published a story in Appalachia about a harrowing trip that she took through Tuckerman Ravine in bad weather in the third issue of the journal. At the time of this Pemajawasset wilderness trip in 1882, she was studying medicine at Boston University and she would go on to graduate in 1884. Unfortunately, she died of typhoid fever the December after she graduated. And an obit that was published in the New England Medical Gazette describes her as having, quote, unfailing and contagious cheeriness that seemed to bring sunshine into the dark places of disease and suffering. So Whitman seems to have brought that same kind of light to her hiking life as well. There are lots of accounts of her hopping from rock to rock in places like Tuckerman Ravine, wading through freezing rivers in long skirts, um, smiling despite all of these difficulties, and on top of that, you know, smiling through a driving rain and freezing weather with imminent darkness as the sun is about to set. So this is definitely somebody you want to have on your hike with you, if for nothing else than having kind of a nonstop cheering section. Next up was Laura Maxwell Porter, MD. She was born in Situate, Mass. in 1839. She spent most of her career as a teacher, but then eventually she decided to become a physician. And she graduated from the New York Women's Medical College and Hospital in 1878. She returned to Boston and started practicing a kind of form of homeopathic medicine. Charlotte Ricker, who was our special correspondent for the White Mountain Echo, was probably born in Topsfield, Mass. around 1849, though she stated in her request to join Scott's party on the Twin Range that she had much mountain experience. It was actually a pretty rough trip for her, and she ended up dropping out uh, a couple of days early because of the ruggedness of the terrain and having kind of a hard time camping out with the rest of the group. Uh, at the end of her trip though, she published a huge three-part um, account of the journey in the White Mountain Echo. And she pronounces, quote, exploration unsuited to woman. <laughs> so the trip beat her up that much that she thought women should not be doing this at all. Uh, although she commends the other ladies in the party for kind of sticking with it. But this trip, I think, would probably test any of us, myself included. Um, this is an approximation on the map here of where they went. It's superimposed on the 1917 White Mountain Guide map for this area. So you can see they kind of, they start over in Twin Mountain and they head up towards the Twin Range and they go all the way across to Gio and Ambond um, and then all the way out across to the other side of the Pemi and then kind of double back and go over the Willy Range too, which is pretty interesting. Uh, but you have to ignore on this map all the trails and other details. The Pemi at this point in 1882 is still a really wild, mostly untouched place with not a lot of pleasant ridge walking and basically no trails to speak of at all. The group followed streams a lot of the time, i.e. they hopped rock to rock until they fell in and just started wading. They had to thrash their way through the Krumholtz, the, the short, very rigid spruce trees that grow around tree line in the White Mountains. And it's really not fun to walk through. It's, it's actually pretty horrible um, to get to any of the higher summits. They try walking over the tops of the Krumholtz and they fall in. They try crawling underneath and just get all scratched up. They try hacking away at it with a hatchet, which is incredibly time consuming and takes a lot of energy. And on their second day out climbing up North Twin, it takes them two hours from the time they reach the Krumholtz line 
or the scrub as they call it, uh, to reach the summit. And looking at maps and um, photos of the area, it could be anything from about a quarter of a mile to a half a mile of this scrub. And it took them two hours to get through it without a trail. So it's hard. Not to mention uh, on their trip, it is also very hot. <laughs> They are, uh, when they get to tree line, they're above the place where there's a lot of water available. There are black flies. On this first day, rain clouds start to gather and they hope to catch enough water in their mouths to ease some of their thirst at all, but all it does is make the scrub wet. And so their trip down the other side of the mountain is just as bad and also very damp. They built camps everywhere that they decided to quit for the night, i.e. A, a stick frame lean-to with some bark wrapped around it that the guides had to assemble through a considerable amount of labor. This is actually a later photograph of a much more elaborate log and bark camp, but you kind of get the idea. It's these big strips of bark that have been laid over this frame. All I can imagine is how many spiders are in that thing <laughs> when I look at it. Or if they decided not to build one of these camps, they would just roll themselves up in blankets and wedge themselves between rocks. They had some food with them, but they depended a lot on the skills of their guides to catch fish in the many trout streams that they saw. And the guides cooked too, although sometimes with disastrous results like when the handle of their pot melted off completely and an entire pot of oatmeal was lost in the fire. A.E. Scott doesn't go into all these gory details in his report in Appalachia about the trip, but Charlotte Ricker certainly does. Um, and all the struggles and myth mishaps and um, trials that she go goes through are thoroughly laid out in the most dramatic means possible in all of her articles. Um, they're really hilarious and awesome to, to read through. So was this expedition a success? Well, most of the party made it over North Twin and uh, up over Geo Bond and Boncliffe and then up over the Willie Range. They, at the very end of it, they went over the slopes of Mount Avalon and down to the carriage road on Mount Willard, and then finally out to the Crawford house where they appeared bedraggled and hungry, stepping out of the woods. Despite all this struggle, it's really interesting to think that they must have done some trailblazing and some hacking. A report from a trip not more than a year later of 22 AMC members follows the same route and they don't complain about any of the same difficulties that this party had, like wading through the scrub. So they seem to have done a little bit of impromptu trail work uh, as they went through in 1882. So running towards the end of the 1880s, things hadn't progressed a whole lot in terms of um, visitation. Augustus Scott's party didn't cause a flood of new visitors into the PEMI with the reports that they were putting out. In Tickner's The White Mountains, A Handbook for Travelers from the 1888 edition, the region is described as, quote, still in a condition of primeval wildness and has not been invaded by clearings, roads, or trails. Clear to the Franconia Notch extends this untracked and unvisited realm of nature who yet holds one fastness in the heart of busy New England, with its glorious falls, not yet harnessed for water powers, and its stately trees, yet undeveloped into sashes and blinds. The solitude should be entered only under the guidance of experienced foresters, and traveling will be found to be very slow and arduous. However, this untracked and unvisited realm, as Tickner describes it, was about to pass into kind of the new phase of life. And it would never be described in these same terms as primeval, untouched, or trackless again. Although we know that logging was happening at the edges of the PEMI, most of the descriptions um, of hikers entering mention following some logging roads at some point, 
these are really small man and horse operations that are just kind of chipping away at the forest edges. It wasn't until 1870 that the logging railroads arrived here in the White Mountains. And at first, they were established in places north of the Pemi, like up in Jefferson, in Lancaster, and Gorham. By 1884, the Zeeland Valley Railroad appeared, where the Zeeland Road is today, off of Route 302. And it made inroads into the forest as far as Ethan and Shoal Ponds. It was the beginning of a long and blackened legacy of the famed timber baron James Everill Henry Boo Hiss. His later Eastern Branch and, and Lincoln Railroad would be one of the most destructive forces in White Mountain's history. And it irreversibly changed the Pemma wilderness and how people were describing it. One of the last parties to record their trip in the Pemi before it started to see widespread logging was a group of four young men, Robert P. Booth, Henry F. Hollis, Edward H. French, and Avery Rand, and a French-Canadian logger named Pete, who acted as their porter. The party set out from Lincoln on June 5th, 1889, so this is kind of in the lower left-hand corner of this map of their trip here. They actually started out by riding what would be the Pemi's worst enemy, a train owned by um, James E. Henry's logging company. They hopped off and started into the woods pretty much where the Lincoln Woods trailhead is today. There were not yet any logging railroads laid along the east branch of the Pemi, but there does seem to have been some trace of a, a game trail or a trail that people were using to get in there. They camped their first night where the river splits for the first time, and the next day they worked their way along what would become the route of the Wilderness Trail, which sprang up only after J.E. Henry's rail lines appeared there in the 1890s and then after they were torn up in the 1940s. The party worked their way across dubious river crossings, through blowdowns, around tricky scrambles, and they slept in lean-tos and other camps that had been left by hunters and trappers that had been there before. As evidence that the area has become much more known and used by this point, they also meet fishermen and men who are out collecting spruce gum in the woods. So there's a small trickle of people that are arriving to start kind of mining the resources that are in this part of the White Mountains. At a spot that's now known as Stillwater Junction, just below Mount Carrigane, they camped for a couple of days and they made a day hike to climb up Carrigane by its southwestern flank where the Desolation Trail would be cut about 45 years later after they were there. Leaving their wilderness camp after four nights, they moved through Carrigane Notch before emerging at Sawyer River where logging roads and railroads corridors led them back to civilized terrain. So they kind of skirt the edge of this, this wilderness area and describe it very much as still pretty wild and um, tangled and untouched. By the early 1890s, the tone of writing starts to change in the area. In an 1893 issue of The Century, a journalist notes, Year by year, the lumbermen have been cutting their way into the White Mountain region, till now they threaten to destroy those tracks which are in greatest glory, and which constitute the chief charm for the thousands of visitors who resort thither year after year from all quarters of the land. Contracts were made several months ago under which the Pemajawasset Wilderness, that magnificent stretch of pathless forest, was to be invaded by the destroyer with his gangs of cutters and his steam sawmill. Another assault was also planned upon the region about the flume and still another upon Albany Intervale. These attacks, if carried out, would completely strip the mountains of their magnificent and imposing vesture, depriving the region of its glory and beauty and taking from the rivers of the state their supply of water. Small wonder that the threat of such appalling devastation 
nay, more, such desecration aroused the whole country, and those appeals were sent from all quarters of the land to have the hand of the destroyer stayed. So you can see things are starting to happen in here. We can see this wave of logging approaching and crashing over the Pemi at the end of the 19th century. And not many hikers seem to venture in there from the 1890s to about the 1910s. But a few come close and they tell us in their own words what they're starting to see in there. So Harold King passed through the edge of the Pemi in 1910. King hailed from Cambridge, Mass, and he knew the mountains well. We actually just recently received this wonderful collection of his images and writing in the archives. And the unique thing about King is that he was actually offering his services as a guide. So this is just one photo from the collection um, showing some of his intrepid companions looking like they're ready to go long out in the backcountry. At the turn of the century, we're starting to see these longer expeditions through the White Mountains and not just for a few days over the presidential range, but hikers taking in the full scope of the region since there's exciting climbing to be had um, on all sides of the Pemi as well. So King was really well prepared for leading these small groups and their route was really pretty ambitious. He advertised his services in the Boston transcript and he got a couple of people to sign up with him. They started out on Mount Chikorua, and over the next two weeks, they headed for Carrigan, they skirted the Pemi, they crossed the Presidentials, they swung back to see the Franconia Range. They really, they took an absolute full sort of on foot and on train tour of the mountains. These are just a few of the resources that King had on hand. He would have been, depending on the very first edition, of the White Mountain Guide that was published in 1907 for um, pretty limited trails information about the Pemi and that side of the mountains. But AMC had also handily published um, little, little materials like this booklet, the suggestions as to outfit for tramping and camping, which has some great recommendations about gear and about food. And King planned out really, really carefully. There's several notebooks in the collection that have everything from his itineraries, from the food list, from the meal itinerary for each day, the mileage that they were doing. He was really trying to um, make this the best possible trip for the people that he was guiding. And we have a little bit of writing from this trip. He does, there's a, a kind of a handwritten account of um, this early guiding expedition. So he starts out um, after just getting over Mount Chikorua and says, the next day's route led us over the peak of Chikorua and down the other side. This has been recently lumbered over and is covered with what is known as slash. That is the branches and debris scattered around and piled up like jack straws. After we had chopped our way through, we came along upon a little brook warbling on its way down the mountainside. From here to Passaconaway is an easy walk and a beautiful one. But we, when we had left the village, we entered some of the original forests that had somehow escaped the lumberman's axe. It is a treat to see these woods. As we walked along under the towering trees, twilight descended, and in a little open spot we made camp. The picture of this describes it better than I can. It is bedded with fragrant balsam boughs, which invited us to a good night's rest. All too soon it was morning again, and after making a little detour to see Sabaday Falls, we continued up the trail to Swift River. The granite bottom of this river is so smooth that we would sit on it and be carried along by the current. It was here that we had a real shower bath. My, but that water was cold. After crossing the river, we followed all the way to Livermore, an abandoned lumber railway, which followed along the banks of the foaming river. This is the heart of the lumber country, and all about us was the ruin of the past year's greed, while on our left were Kankamagus and Hancock, with hardly a bush standing on their scarred sides. 
Woodsmen say that lumber companies didn't leave enough for a good toothpick. As we walked along, we came on some horses out in the forest, miles away from the nearest dwelling. They were very shy and ran away when we appeared. Late in the afternoon, we came to Livermore, a typical logging town, full of the screaming and wailing of the saws and the scent of wet logs and sawdust. It's great fun to go through such a place, but a relief to get back into the silent forest. Imagine coming upon scenes like this in the Pemajawasset wilderness today. Just unbelievable. From the late 1890s through the next few decades, the Pemi was now the territory of these loggers. Following the, in their wake were forest fires springing up from the logging slash, making the region even less attractive and difficult to navigate. The 1916 edition of AMC's White Mountain Guide, so the, the very next edition after the 1907, cautions hikers that, quote, in the previous edition of the guide, it was stated that the region about the headwaters of the east branch of the Pemajuwasset contained one of the largest tracts of virgin forest in New England. Since that date, much of this fine timber has fallen before the lumberman, and the only remaining stand of any considerable size is based on the, uh, is that on the North Fork. Accordingly, while the following descriptions are based on the latest information in the hands of the writers, it is possible to speak with certainty since conditions change rapidly in a field where active lumbering is in progress. So trail descriptions in this edition of the guide are suddenly using words like barren, burned country, charred trunks still standing, and desolate. So not a great picture of the area anymore. In 1937, an article in Survey Graphic magazine reports, quote, one looked into the East Branch wilderness, once the last great area of virgin forest in the state. The lumber companies have hacked their way through now. A spindly, ragged second growth is all that is left of these great pines, spruces, and hemlocks. So after the loggers have finally left, it would take a long, long time for the forest to really come back to the point that anybody would start describing this as a wilderness again. Hiking through the Pemi in 1929, after a lot of the loggers have already left and the second growth has started to come in, Robert Underhill describes the area as a wasteland covered with rank grass and pitiful second growth with scars of fire on the surrounding hills. Its openness of desolate outlook stirs the imagination more subtle fashion than does the more normal scenery of the White Mountains. It is as if one had penetrated into a forgotten no man's land between the accepted routes of travel and come unsuspectingly upon a hidden devastation fascinating in its very extent and utterness. This sounds bad. <laughs> So as the logging finally begins to recede and the national forest is, is finally created, the tracks are added to the forest and trails finally slowly start to creep into the Pemi. The maps of the time show that there's possibilities now for completing routes through the area. One could theoretically have done what is known today as the Pemi Loop, um, going over the Franconia Ridge, Twinway, Bonds, and back around to the East Branch, Pemajuasset River Valley as early as 1928. The map shows that you could make this route at that time. But most people seem to have been still going directly across the Pemi. Um, this, start, this is still a really rugged, multi-day traverse as well, although it's a little bit easier by the 1920s because of all of the camps and campsites and eventually huts that are out there in the woods. Through the 1920s, camping in log shelters was kind of the way to go, but there was one party writing about their hike through the Pemi that starts to help witness for us the next phase in the life of this wilderness area. So Nolan Wood, was a Dartmouth student and an avid hiker, and he recorded all of his mountain climbs and camping trips in his journals, which we have in the archives. 
He did a route, um, just as I mentioned, in 1929. He talks about using logging roads in some places and old rare routes, but now the tracks have been pulled up and he's and his companions are mostly on established trails. So no more of the 1882 scrambling through the scrub method of getting through the penny. And it's also kind of come full circle as a place that hikers actually want to go again. And the way is clear for them to do that. So climbing the old bridal path, he and his group come upon the construction site of Greenleaf Hut, which was being built in 1929. And it opened the following year in 1930. Later in the trip, they stay at Galehead Shelter, although this too would eventually become a full hut site in 1932. Not that better shelter made the PEMI any less difficult. It's really interesting to read Wood's entries about crossing some of the same terrain as that 1882 party, though now they're mostly traversing second growth forests and it's not the primeval wilderness of old. He sets down this wonderful little stream of consciousness section in his journal that channels probably the same thoughts that Charlotte Rooker was, had, was having while she um, walked across the Pemi in 1882. Or really, it's, it, there's a lot of similar complaints to I think all of us hiking <laughs> in conditions like this. So Milton Wood writes in his journal, crossing the Pemi, flies, flies, flies. I wonder if we'll ever be free from flies again. What makes this pack so heavy? This must be the trail where the log has been cut through. Flies. I wish I could wet my handkerchief in some water and keep the flies off. I hope it doesn't rain before we reach Gar Garfield Pond. Chocolate ice cream soda would be good. Dumb egg that built this trail might have gone around these hills instead of over them. Flies. Look out for potholes between the rocks. Ain't nature grand. <laughs> this sounds kind of like what I would be thinking on, say, maybe when I'm marching down the Twinway. <laughs> um, not specific to the Pemi at all, but um, you can see that it's, it's kind of reassuring that the hikers are thinking about their own trials and struggles and not so much noting the ruination of the landscape of the place anymore. So it's a sure sign that nature is coming back, even if the trails aren't getting any easier. So this corner of the White Mountains, as you've heard from all these journal entries and articles, has had a really hard journey. But with the historical resources at hand and the work of all these explorers and these map makers, we can step into the history and just get this inkling of what the region was like before it was the unbroken green forest carpet that we know today. So if you find yourself deep in the Pemajawasset wilderness or traversing the Krumholtz covered peaks that ring the area, next time, stop and close your eyes and imagine a seemingly endless swath of thick, dark, dark spruce forest. There are no trails, there are no roads, there are no railroads. The trail that you're walking on has vanished and you have to find your way to um, wade through miles of waist high from Holtz. And then as you're out there, shift your thoughts to the decades around the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th and see the forests cut back to the steepest slopes that the loggers are able to get to. You can hear the clang of a train hauling logs on a flatbed out of the valley. You can hear the commotion of a sawmill or the bustle of men in the woods with axes. And then finally, bring yourself back to our own time and see the Pemajawasset return to this beautiful shade of green again, this mosaic of forest that is mostly second, third growth. And there are hidden little pockets of ancient trees out there, but it's crisscrossed by barely perceptible roads, abandoned railroad tracks. It's dotted with campsites and it's 
full of hikers. And you can see this living landscape and the past kind of layered on top of all the other preceding decades. So when you look at the scene for yourself the next time, you can look down at the map and do your own form of not only geographical, but kind of historical wayfinding as well. And that's all. <laughs> oh my gosh, Becky, thank you so much. Sure. I, I love your research and how you find these wonderful passages that just I'm just eating up those words. They, they were painting like incredible visions for me. I just, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I love doing the research for this kind of thing and finding those very specific excerpts and places where people have written about a specific particular place. And you can really just get a feeling for what was it like out there? What was it really like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really love, see, the, this perspective that you've brought to our conversation about maps is you've got the, you totally were so successful. You've got these, the pictures of the maps, and then you connected that, that through these people's words to this physical engagement with the landscape. It was just, just phenomenal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, well, if anyone has questions or comments, please put them in the chat and Rebecca will um, sift through for, um, for Becky to um, just hang on to her, uh, her knowledge for a little bit longer this evening. Um, I hope you all have enjoyed this, this uh, talk. I sure have. Wow. I uh, love the contrast of that. It, like, I like that you focused on one particular area. That was really, really cool. Really yeah. great idea. Thank you, Becky. We do have some questions. Um, uh, this is just a cute comment from John. Hooray for Miss X. I love that. It was great to hear that whole, like that she, <laughs> she was going to go, darn it. Um, so this first question is from Ed. Um, thank you. That was fascinating. What was Wood's first name, please? 1929 hike. Norton? Knowlton? You could just repeat that. Knowlton. Yeah, Knowlton. Uh, Knowlton. Kate. Yeah, K-N-O-W-L-T-O-N. Thank you. That right. <laughs> All right, question from Marcia. Um, where was the third to last photo taken? Also, what was the historical photo that follows it taken? Such an amazing contrast. Yeah, um, so let's see. Let me go back. Right, so this one was taken from uh, the summit of Garfields. So that's Owl's head kind of sticking up in the middle um, of the PEMI. Um, this one is South Twin, I think, looking back towards the Lafayette um, Franconia Ridge. So you can see um, Garfield Summit over on the left side, and then the Franconia Ridge goes all the way across. So this is like right at the height of logging. Um, you can see all the logging roads down in the valley and that the uh, logging goes all the way up the, steep, uh, the slopes as far as they can possibly get, um, which is a really amazing image. Uh, and then this one is from that same spot, which I took in, I think, 2015. So this is maybe like six years ago, that same area. Um, and it's interesting when you're kind of looking, especially if you're at, say, Galehead Hut, you can still see sort of the lines where the logging roads used to go across the slopes as they sort of work their way up. So there's there are places where you can really still visual, visually see the, the scars of the logging operations. But if you're if you're just looking at it, it's like, yeah, it's got it's forest all over it. Like that's cool. But there's all this other stuff going on underneath that is so fascinating. Very cool. Um, next question from Elizabeth. Uh, did the explorers take down the camps when they left? Has anyone ever found traces of them? Um, I think the camps of that era were pretty disposable. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I think some of them logging camps were put on top of them, so you can't really find traces of it. Um, but I do know that when they were, when folks were actively camping out there, if, if you built like a little um, stick and bark lean-to, you'd often just leave it and people would come back and use it after you. And in fact, in, um, I'm reading 
Jane and Ben English's books are mountain trips right now. And they talk about in the early 1900s, they go on these camping trips and they build some little shelters and camps for themselves and they leave it there. And then they'll, they'll take a picture of the same spot a couple of years later when they come back and say, oh yeah, here's some traces of our camps um, from that, you know, from a few years ago. But I don't think that most of these really temporary shelters, you would find evidence of them now. All the wood would have um, rotted away over the last hundred plus years. So pretty, pretty unlikely. Unless they left like a bucket or a pail or something. <laughs> Nope, Elizabeth says, oh, that's neat. Thank you. So thank you, Becky. Um, question from Carolyn. Uh, when were the huts built? How many were built in the PEMI area? Oh, so um, the PEMI was kind of a, the second half of the huts building bonanza. So the very first hut was built in 1888 over on Mount Madison on the presidential range. Uh, and then there were a couple of other huts built there. The, the Pemajawasset and sort of what was known as the Western Division of Huts didn't start up until 1929 when actually it was uh, at Lonesome Lake. So on the other side of Franconia Notch when Lonesome Lake Hut was created. And then Greenleaf opened in 1930 and Zealand Falls Hut and Galehead Hut both opened in 1932. So those Greenleaf, Galehead, and Zealand are technically the three huts that are in, in, in or on the edge of the PEMI, kind of depending on where you draw the line. They're along the ridge lines, so. Cool, good to know. Um, let's see, question from Peter, how did they navigate? Good question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, from what I understand, they would have had, or had examined copies of say that 1853 map. So that would be kind of one of the few available maps that was out there. And then there was the 1871 um, Hitchcock map. So you could kind of see where the rivers were, but basically they, um, well, for getting up to summits, a lot of it was sort of like point of view. You, are standing in the valley and you see a mountain up there and you head in that general direction. Um, but a lot of it was based on stream navigation. They had a pretty good sense of where the streams were and the branches of the major streams. So um, you have the little river that comes down from the twin range. So you kind of follow the little river up until you come to where you presume the slopes of North Twin start and then you head uphill. <laughs> Um, and it, with a lot of these, like the 1882 party, they had a guide with them and he was a pretty experienced woodsman and had a little bit more of a sense of where he was in that area from um, going on hunting and fishing expeditions. Um, but there's a lot of, a heck of a lot of stream-based navigation and, and word of mouth when you're trying to figure out where you're supposed to go. You ask somebody else and they kind of describe <laughs> where you're supposed to go. Um, but a, a lot of these accounts also feature people going out into the PEMI and presuming that they're going to go stay at this camp spot that somebody else had established a while ago and searching around and getting lost a bunch of times before they actually find that camp. So there's a certain degree of trial and error to go along with it. That is Terrifying to me. Okay, um, let's do, maybe we combine, can combine these two and these will be our last two questions. Um, so from Adam, any reports of animals, in particular bear or moose encountered on these hikes? And then a question from John, um, building the huts, how much reliance on horses? Oh, um, let's see, well, animals, uh, It's that's really interesting because Augustus Scott's 1882, account of their trip, he reports that they saw hardly any wildlife whatsoever, <laughs> um, aside from the fish that they were occasionally catching and eating. But Charlotte Ricker's account of the same trip, she talks about how they almost ran into a bear, how there were all these other creatures out in the woods, like she kind of really ups the <laughs> wow factor of wildlife out there. 
Um, I didn't encounter a ton of accounts of bears. I think, you know, at that point they were, as they are today, they're pretty skittish and will likely stay away from you as much as they possibly can. Um, you hear a lot about a lot of game birds out there, the grouse, the ubiquitous spruce grouse that we still find today. People um, run into them quite a bit. Um, and the occasional deer and things like that, but not a, not a ton of wildlife. I think they were they were wise <laughs> to uh, the intruders at that era. Um, and then the huts question, um, not a lot of reliance on horses for building the huts, although we did have a pack of donkeys that were that the AMC actually purchased and had shipped from New Mexico. And they hauled a lot of supplies and lumber and things for uh, particularly the Western division of huts. So Greenleaf and Galehead and Zealand. There was also a tractor involved that went way up the Zealand Valley um, when Zealand Falls hut was being used. And then the materials would be transferred to these little cute donkeys. Um, so there's lots of stories about them too. We had, we had donkeys in use for the huts up until this whispering hut was built in 1964. So they were around for a couple of decades being used to haul things um, up the mountain. Great. Thank you so much. What great questions. And, and uh, thank you, Becky, for all that work and for telling us such great stories. Uh, thank you to everybody for being here this evening. And please, um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, please go to, um, when Rebecca sends you the link to the um, presentation, um, please click on the survey question that will um, give us the uh, data that our funder, the New Hampshire Humanities would like. So please help us by completing that survey. That'd help us a lot. So um, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Rebecca for managing. Fantastic. Um, and have a great evening and we hope to see you at the next one.